Welcome to the Cup of Nurses podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome to Cup of Nurses podcast. We're your hosts, Matt Sonatrick, and myself, Peter Fendero. This is a podcast where we tackle current health news and hot nurse topics one conversation at a time. How are you guys doing today? Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for listening. We welcome you guys with our open arms, right? Of course, always. Um, nothing new going on lately, guys. Facebook group, Travel Checklist, get on that. Like, share, and we like those five stars, guys, right? Yeah. Well, that was getting cold, too, I've noticed. I've been turning my AC off at night. Have you? I've been turning it down. I've been turning it off. I've been, I've been using windows. Up. I'm sorry, yeah. Are you turning it up? Up. Meaning, like, it's getting, temperature. It's getting cold, so I'm putting up the temperature, like, 75, guys. I like to sleep at 75. It just... It's just perfect where I could uncover my feet and fall asleep like a baby. Really? I do like 70, 70 or 69. But then I have the wall AC. You have mm-hmm. the whole um, central or whatever mm-hmm. it's called. So I like it cold. Yeah. So today, guys, we're going to talk about the ketogenic diet, how it's, you know, became like a fad, gained a lot of tremendous popularity in the Western um, civilization here. And it's used for weight loss. And the question is, is it a good diet? Is it for you? Is it a good lifestyle? And we're also going to talk about DNA testing, how it's a way for health prevention, health prediction, and it could possibly become a good gift maybe for Christmas for someone. Yeah, they're pretty cool. But it's more expensive than all the other testings that we do. Yeah, so what's this test kit, kit about? So I'm sure everyone's heard of the 23andMe and all those other DNA testing kits where they kind of check where your genome is from, so like what country or what part of the hemisphere you're at. Well, now it's as getting more modern and as technology it gets better, they're able to do a DNA testing on your genome and actually figure out what diseases you are more prevalent in getting. This is fairly common with like certain cancers where they could check for their markers on your DNA. So it's just, it's like a DNA sequencing tool, right? It kind of takes a tad of your DNA and it kind of checks the uh, genome and to see what you're susceptible for. Yeah. So how the 23andMe works and those kind of uh, genome testing is they basically take a swab of your of your cheek or some kind of oryx saliva, and they run it on a database that has millions and millions of other DNAs from all different parts of the world, and they kind of compare yours to which ones you're most similar to. Okay. This is very similar, but it's a little bit more expensive. They take your blood, they take your saliva, and they also do like a, a physical and like a history. And they're able to use that with like even a bigger database. Their database for this is bigger because they've been dealing with diseases for years and years and years. And they run your genome and test it against people with similar genomes and kind of what they died from, what they're inclined to getting or what they have gotten in the past. So it's possibly a really good source of, uh, like, we could say prevention. So what they want to do with this, it's not really telling you, hey, you're going to get, let's say, prostate cancer or breast cancer. It's basically another way to prevent you from getting it. So they want to use this test as, like, hey, You should get a mammogram a little bit more often. You should go see your doctor and get a prostate check more often, you know, compared to a normal individual. It's not, it's not something where they could just use CRISPR technology and literally cut out that bad part of the gene and replace something. No. It's just letting you know what you're susceptible to and you could be more aware of that and you could take, you know, bigger steps to preventing the, um, your risk of disease. Right. Yeah. So this is still in like the earlier stages. So for the most part, they can't fully guarantee that this is correct and you are predisposed to cancer or prostate cancer, it says you might be predisposed. Okay. So they're using this as like a way to get people to see the doctor more often and more regularly. Because if I tell you, hey, you might have a chance of prostate cancer, you're probably going to gonna get your prostate checked probably sooner than, a, than an average individual. I think it's 50, right, for men to see, take their prostate? Yeah. 50 or 40? That's 50. Yeah. So they'll probably make you more inclined to take it in 50 instead of putting it up to 55 or 60 like normal people because no one wants to you know get their I wish, I wish our healthcare system gave this as like a freebie right so hey everybody should get their you know dna tested or something to see what we're susceptible to but it's just probably not affordable for us um well the articles that i read one title was genomic testing um like for prevention and it had in parentheses, in parentheses it said for the wealthy for the most oh, part okay. so this ranges this rough roughly ranges about a thousand dollars just for this test so come in, you pay a thousand, you get your genes looked at, but then you also gotta pay for the next visits, and those cost money too, because it's, it's like an ongoing process for the most part. It's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not a one visit thing; it's like three or four. It's like a car you buy a you know you buy a car and you gotta come for maintenance and oil changes, and they get you in the long run too. Yeah, there you go. But you no, know, if you're wealthy and you have the money for it, like right now, 
like I said, this is like the initial stages, so it's going to be expensive. Yeah. But as people will do it more often and as this gets better and um, more affordable, people are going to do it. It might yeah. be like a goal in your doctor. <clears throat> excuse me. Maybe eventually it's going to get done with your, with your physical. You yeah. go to your doctor every year, they might add this in like the next 10 years. Yeah. You never know. It would be and pretty cool. It would be. And the other one's called VO Me. So this one I found, it's more where they send you something in the mail. You basically take a sample of your poop, you put it in the box, and you send it out to them. And they check your um, gut microbe. If you guys haven't listened to our like podcast episode about the mind-body connection, we really talk about the gut microbe, how that affects and alters like your mind, your health, and everything else. And this is a great indicator to see how your overall health is because 80% of the immune system is in the gut. And this is going to let you know if you have a lot of like inflammation markers, if you're producing specific gases, maybe you could avoid a specific uh, tests or I'm sorry, specific foods. And it's only $149 right now. So that's, that's actually pretty affordable. And the technology that they're using is called metal transcriptic sequencing technology. It's pretty, pretty good. Pretty big word, yeah. So Four they're words. basically cutting up a bacteria and just understanding what it's doing in your gut. I think that's very cool. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I think, but for, I feel like for this to be really accurate, you'd have to kind of not change anything you're eating. Like, you know, when you have a dentist appointment coming up, you know, you want to, you kind of put more effort into taking care of your teeth because you don't want your dentist to tell you shit about your teeth. That, that's not good. Yeah. Or when you go see a doctor for, let's say you're on metformin and, you know, you're going for your every other month or every three months check up with your doctor and he takes your blood sugar you're probably gonna eat healthier because you don't want your doctor to see that hey your sugar's you know 250 what have you been eating you're like i haven't been eating I've been, I've been doing yeah. eating so healthy. in order to prevent skewing the results you should probably be eating the same consistent thing prior to taking this test exactly yeah but well, yeah. now they have the a1c test where if you you know you can eat healthy for a week and have your blood sugar be stabilized but the a1c is going to give you over three month period so you're yeah. not going to know you're cheating compared exactly to, compared to this i think you're you're you know through your, by the time food goes into your GI tract and, turns, and comes out poop, I think it's like 24 hours, right? Turnover rate. Yeah. So yeah, you could probably got to be eating pretty consistently. Where do you think the future is with this technology? Uh, I don't know. I think it'd be pretty cool. I, I would probably say that blood sampling are probably more accurate. That might kind of show you what you're more sort of about to or what you're sen- uh, sensitive to. Imagine, to. imagine if they're, like, this podcast I listened to with um, that one David guy, they would imagine implanting something into your body where it's giving information on repeat 24 hours a day and it's able to warn you if you have a buildup of cancer cells or something. I think that technology would be very life saving if they, you know, invented something like that. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see it happening within the next like 10, 15 years because technically we already have that the glucose monitor system where it consistently checks your blood glucose. I'm not sure if it's every second, every minute, but it's every like certain amount of minutes where it checks. I'm sure we could probably create something like that if there's something out there but already. Then that you know, then there's Big Brother, there's privacy of information breaching, and we have to kind of set that line of: Do you want to do that? Are you willing to give up your privacy to the point of being checked internally? Right, you know? Like insurance companies, like insurance might be like, "Hey, yeah, so I've seen you're wearing this DNA testing." testing thing where it always checks your blood can we take a look at your history or what if they would um stop you from getting health insurance or increase your rates because you are having unsanitary lifestyle and that device is telling you right away yeah. just like you know car insurances if you're driving over 10k a year they you could pay less if you install the speedometer or not the odometer right where they check your miles but if you're speeding or if you're driving too much it'll increase the rate that's i don't want that right yeah or, or even just like think about it even if like you're real healthy but your genes say that you're predisposed to, you know, four different types of, types of cancers. But you're living a healthy lifestyle. They could be like, hey, he's like a cancer some of these Let's raise his rates. Then they introduced you to do like swabbing of the cheek. And they, they would check if you're a smoker or not a smoker by that. I think there was something like that that they did back in the day. Maybe like even five or ten years ago. I'm not sure. Because I remember I mean, my uncle or somebody told me that insurance, for you to get a lower rate of insurance, they had this thing where you'd, they did swab your cheek or take your saliva, and then that would show if you're a smoker or not a smoker. And if you're a non smoker, you got a, a less of a, a premium or a deduct, deductible or something. I, I know that I know they do that for like life insurance. Mm. If you're a smoker, you automatically get a lot less, mm. and or you can't get it after like sixty five. You only can get it between sixty for a smoker. They have all these little statistical things that not a lot. They don't allow you to do things, and they could keep a record and they could check to see if you actually have that health history from your doctor. They actually. Do they actually swab your cheek, though, or do they just ask you questions? Not sure. 
Not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't get I'm not even far. sure if I have. I don't even think I have life insurance. Do you have life insurance? I don't no. know. Life insurance. We're too young, old. man. I have a four hundred one k. You're not yeah. twenty four either. Twenty five. And getting old. Twenty five. I have. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. For sure, I have life insurance. I think my parents are. We had this guy come one time. My parents have life insurance, and he tried to. He talked to me personally and tried to convince me to get life insurance. I'm like, no. He's like, well, it's only like four dollars a month. I'm like, I'm not gonna. Right. I'm okay. I'm you know? okay. Do you want to jump into the keto? Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. So the keto diet is basically high fat, low protein, and it's something that's been very popular, and it's been getting a lot of traction. We want to cover it to see whether it's actual healthy diet and the benefits that are actually happening from this diet. We're going to see if they're actually true. Right. Yeah. So the ketogenic diet, what is it? It's basically a diet where you try to eliminate as much carbs as possible. So it's a high protein, high fat diet with minimum or no uh, no carbs. There are different variations of it, but usually most of them want to keep carbs below, I think, either 50 or 20. I think it might have been 20 or 25 or 50. There's different variations. The so lower, the more. better, honestly, because right. you don't want your, you want the main source of energy to be from fat, not from carbs. Exactly. So when we consume carbs, our body create, creates glucose out of the carbs to use as energy. And that's kind of what drives our, our body and uh, all the metabolism and all everything that's going on in our body is just driven by carbs and glucose. So when we don't have any carbs or we're carb restricted, our body doesn't have any glucose to use for energy. So it switches to something called ketones. And that's basically derived from your fat. So your body doesn't have enough carbs to create glucose. So the next easiest thing to tackle is your fat. So you're going to get the fat from your diet or it's going to take the fat from your body. Yeah. So just imagine literally switching a source of energy, like a gas, like imagine tanking up diesel instead of like the regular 87 gas think about it like that and you're literally switching your body's fuel source and you're burning ketones which um it does have side effects i don't know if you ever tried the diet but when you first start you have like this like flu-like symptoms you're so fatigued you're you you're very out of it. you don't feel like doing anything and you have like this dragon breath that is not you know favorable it smells really bad like one of those diabetic ketoacidosis breaths the fruity one you got to kind of chew some gum in between, to be honest. Yeah, so it's it's a process because we're used to eating carbs, and that's what our body is used to yeah. get energy off of. But now, like Matt said, you get dragon breath, you get like the, the other metabolic events that happen from the transition from glucose to basically ketosis or ketones. And what's what about the variations? So the most popular one, do you know which variation is the most popular? I'm going to guess the standard one. The standard one. So standard is very low carb, moderate protein, and then high fat. So for that one, you usually have 75% fat, 20% protein, and 5% carb. So that's really, really, really low. And if you would like to even find out if you are in ketosis, which is a state of burning ketones, you could get little test strips like in Walmart. And I've done it myself where you could just kind of pee on the strip and it'll give you like um, an indicator, different lines and it'll tell you like what's like the range of ketones you're actually burning and whether you're even in ketosis to begin with because it takes a little bit of time. Yeah, it was definitely. I've done um, the keto, jet, keto diet one time. And that's the only time I've gotten abs in my life. But I did the high-protein keto diet, which was 60% fat, 35% protein, and 5% carbs. Actually, I probably went a little bit further. I probably had more protein than I had fat. So it's kind of like more of a... Alternate. And how, how did you feel being on a diet? Um, I felt good. Like you said, the transition phase was, was kind of a little bit rough just because, you know, like I said, you get a little tired, fatigued. And plus, I was fasting too. So, like, fasting plus the keto diet, eliminating carbs, I did both at the same time off the bat. And you definitely feel, feel the effects, especially like at the gym. I started getting kind of nauseated, kind of lightheaded, things like that. Just And then you kind of get used to it, things stabilize, your body, get, body gets used to it, and you don't get those symptoms. I rarely get like at the gym unless I do like really like strenuous exercise. Yeah. And sometimes even when you're fasting between your 16 hour fast, you could get into ketosis, but you have to have a very low carb diet the day before. Like ideally, if you want to be really strict with your diet, you probably want to go low carb, high carb, alternate those and do intermittent fasting. And you're going to really see the benefits. And on your days off, if you do low carb, you'll be able to push your body into ketosis for a little bit of time. And that's really great for different um, metabolic prevention that we could talk about right now, right? Different exactly. factors. Yeah, r- real quick, but like the thing is with, with a keto diet, I feel like you got to be really consistent because you could probably cheat, eat carbs or eat high carbs, maybe 
once or twice, maybe like three times tops a month. Because then if you do like two or three days in a row of eating carbs, you're getting yourself out of ketosis. Yeah. And that completely negates the, the effect of the keto diet. Because then you're back on, on carbs, you're back on uh, you know, breaking down carbs for glucose. And I wonder how stressful that's on your body switching over. Like, I don't think I did my research on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing, it, the, even if it's stressful or not, the fact that you put yourself out of ketosis, you work so hard to get into ketosis, and now you start back from scratch because you ate carbs for, you know, a, a full day or two or three days in a row, and then you're kind of screwed because then the next day, the fourth day where you stop eating carbs, you're not going to be in ketosis. You know, your body's going to transition again. So it's going to take another two or three days just to transition to fully, fully ketosis. So you're basically de- de- uh, denying and delaying your, your health benefits from keto diet. Yeah. So just commit if you want to do this right. because there's no need to be jumping back and forth. Right. And some of these benefits that we experience, so for one, right, because we're eating fewer carbs, our body on a low-carb diet has better blood sugar levels. They're more maintained. And also your um, insulin, is, insulin sensitivity is going to come back a little bit better. And what happens is over time, if you're eating a high carb diet, you're you have you develop insulin resistance. Like these cells do not take in sugar properly, and that's where you start having this metabolic syndrome problems, and it predisposes you to um, type two diabetes. So one benefit of this is low carb helps uh, with insulin um, sensitivity. Yeah, another one would be the fact that you're limiting carbs, so you're getting ketone bodies in your system. The fact that you're limiting carbs, a lot of times carbs are the reason for inf- inflammation. Just because, Matt, like Matt said, it raises insulin. Insulin is associated with inflammation, especially if you have a lot of carbs, it inflammates your gut. It inflames your, your arteries, your, your veins, and all that gets affected through insulin and, and through carbs, especially if you're on a high-carb diet, especially if you're eating a lot more carbs than you're supposed to, especially if your calorie intake is higher than your calorie expenditure. Then you're kind of screwing yourself with all this inf- inflammation. And since you're going to be on low carbs or no carbs at all, you're in ketosis and you have the ketones, so that decreases your risk for certain cancers. A lot of uh, people get rid of Alzheimer's. Well, they don't get rid of Alzheimer's. It not predisposes you, it, but it helps less you, and you don't break down like neurologically. Basically. Exactly. So it helps prevent Alzheimer's. Um, a lot of help with epilepsy and Parkinson's disease because a lot of those diseases are start in the gut. Like Parkinson's, we've talked about multiple times where it starts in the gut, and if you eliminate the inflammation in your gut, that's gonna cause less chance of you Parkinson's disease. I think that one doctor, so guys, like this one doctor basically said that all autoimmune diseases are from a state of inflammation in the body. Right, yeah. And number one cause of inflammation is, you know, carbs. Carbs, sugar, the standard American diet of high salt, low fiber, all that stuff, guys. It's unfortunately not helping us. Yeah. So with having a high fat diet, people are going to assume that it'll probably raise your triglycerides and your, and your LDL and an HDL in your body. Uh, there's a few research studies that examine this, and they show that your LDL, unfortunately, will increase, but it's also followed by an increase in HDL. HDL. So that's kind of like, it kind of balances out in the, in the long run. So it's really not that big of a deal. And probably the, the main one and the best um, benefit out of this that will probably benefit everybody is fat loss. Like we said before, that you're not going to be using glucose, you're going to be using fats yeah. for for your energy. And we could touch about it in the next, um, next topic. So what are the health benefits of um, eating keto, the keto diet, right? So one of them we explain is weight loss. And we know as ketosis is a normal function when we're depriving our body from eating low carb. And what happens is because we're not having excess carbs to be stored as fat, we're doing the exact opposite. We're actually pulling fat from our fat storage, which is a reservoir technically for us. And we're able to burn those fats and turn them into ketones. And essentially, we're depriving our fat cells. And we don't, I, is it true that we have only, we have a specific amount of fat cells. What happens is they just grow because they keep getting um, s- stuffed with things, correct? Yeah. So we're essentially reducing fat and gonna, we're going to be trimming down, right? One of the right. benefits. And that's why it works so well for many if they stick to it. And it's almost like a little hack instead of, eating, watch what you're eating and doing all this. A lot of people are able to eat what they want on ketone as long as it's on keto, as long as it's in in the fat category and they're able to lose weight. Yeah. Many times people lose interest in diets because it restricts a lot of food that they're allowed to eat. In a keto diet, only thing you're restricting is is carbs. So that's going to be like your breads and your your pastas, things like that. But you can still eat a lot of things that that you enjoy, like beans, um, different meats, fish, 
everything that's that's high in protein that really gets you full longer. Yeah, I think those beans I watch out for though. Yeah, probably beans are a lot of carb dense, but I've I've ate beans on keto, and I've like if you if you're gonna pick carbs, pick a healthier carb, either either some fruits or, or some beans. I even had rice, but I kind of didn't do too much rice because that's that's a little bit more carbs carbs yeah. than beans. Same same thing. For example, a lot of people don't know is uh, oh they're saying avoid vegetables because they have carbs. Well, like there's like this law where let's just say you're eating a uh, 10 calorie celery, right? Five of those carbs are from fiber. So you're technically only ingesting five grams of carbs into your bloodstream. And the other five grams, because it's fiber, it's not um, it's not soluble. So it stays in the gut and it acts as um, like to add bulk to your stool. Yeah. So, you, so that's why a lot of people don't know that, that you could eat vegetables, just look at that fiber intake and subtract your carbs if you want to be a little bit more OCD about what's the percentage of carbs that I'm eating. Right, yeah. And you, when you look at the nutrition label, it doesn't separate that for you. It tells you like your, the carbs you see on like a, you know, box of rice, that's your carbs from fiber and your carbs in general. So you, you could, subtra- if it says 10 grams of carbs and five grams of fiber, you could tr- subtract the five from the 10 and that's five grams of carbs is the, what your body's actually going to use to fuel itself. And you could add those five grams for another dish that you want to eat if you're, you know, using my fitness pal and I'd like to kind of have squeeze in an extra, I don't know, a couple more beans on the plate, you know? There you go. Yeah, so there's like a cascade. So wh- why this works is, or how this works for the most part, like down to the basics is, first off, your body's always going to use glucose as number one for energy because it's the simplest thing to break down and easiest. And a lot of people say that if you don't eat carbs, you're going to break down muscle if you don't have enough intake of carbs. Well, that's false because after you run out of carbs, so you don't make any glucose, your body turns to breaking down fat because that's the second easiest thing to break down. And your protein, proteins, when you eat proteins, it gets broken down to amino acids. And that's usually used for building blocks, creating tissue, um, creating hormone, hormone, hormone regulation and all that. So your body breaks that down last because you technically need protein to function as, as a human being. And you also need fats because fats also fuel hormones. You could cut out majority of your, of your carbs and still have a completely healthy lifestyle. If you cut out a majority of your fats or a majority of your protein, you're not going to be very healthy for very I think long. That's why low fat is really bad for you because you're like one of, one of those hormones, leptin, and then um, GH, arioline, gr- granulin or something, they stimulate your metabolic process. And eating low fat, you're not stimulating and you're not producing the right hormones and you're only starving yourself from that. So low, low fat's actually really bad. Right. A lot of people that have low fat diets, they, they sometimes have trouble ha- having kids because... It messes with your estrogen. Yep. Because fat is linked to your sex hormones. Same with testosterone. When have, men have testosterone I- issues, the first thing they should change is their, their diet. Are they are you eating low fat? Or is everything you buy labeled low fat or no fat? That's probably what's causing you to have low testosterone. Just because of the food you're eating that you think it's healthy, it's, it's really not. No, it's it's good to have food that's say, labeled low fat if you're if you consume a lot of fat. If your triglycerides triglycerides are high or you have a lot of low density um, lipids in your, in your body, then you should probably can consider eating low fat. But if you're an average individual that's that has no issues with, with cholesterol or anything like that, then you should be fine eating fat. Yeah, same thing with that myth that you mentioned about like let's just say burning fat. A lot of people associate like intermittent fasting with like burning fat. Like, oh, you're not eating before your workout. Oh, you're not eating after your workout. No, I'm not eating when I, I'm not eating. I work out still. I go to sleep and I'll eat in six hours and I'm fine. And I'm actually gaining weight because I'm increasing my calories and I'm actually putting on muscle guys. So like all that bro science that you guys hear is just like an, it's just a giant industry that's fueled by making profit. So they want you to eat your little six square meals and eat a protein shake before and after and take freaking amino acids three times a day. It's all, it's, you know, it's marketing. Exactly. It's, it is. It's all marketing. Like if you have an idea that says, or you're doing a research study and you already have the idea of, let's say, intermittent fasting is going to break that muscle. If I'm, if I'm a marketing person that's against intermittent fasting, I could create research studies saying that, hey, if you intermittent fast, you're going to break that muscle. It's false, but you could engineer each you know, subgroup or you could engineer um, you know, the, just like your component that, that you're using, all the variables to you know, fit what you want to hear. Like a lot of times where people said that, hey, if, if you fast, you're going to break that muscle because you're not eating. I'm not eating for, I'm only not eating for 18 hours a day or 16 hours a day. I'm not not eating for a week. You know, I'm not 
Jesus Christ in doing a 40 day, you know, fast in, in a desert. No, I'm just not eating for 16 hours a day. I mean, for the rest of the day, it's like, I'm not starving myself. Or if you're an educated individual, you're going to know that the food that you eat today is not going to get broken down till tomorrow. So we're, we have our circadian rhythms in 24 hours and that includes our sleep and our, and our eating. It's not like we're starving ourselves the whole time. Couldn't say, it, but couldn't say it better myself. That's what I'm saying, man. What about like, so we think of fat as being one source, but sometimes we have like visceral fat too, right? Yeah. Is that the first or second way of fat that's gets going to get consumed? I'm actually curious because visceral fat is the mo- most dangerous type of fat. And it's in a deeper part. It's around like our organs. And one cool thing with going into ketosis is you're able to tap into those cells that have all this visceral fat around your organs and they get released. And a lot of people don't know is sometimes this fat actually has toxic properties. So if you're like, if you have a bunch of fat from, you know, X amount of years chill around the visceral area, you're predisposing your organs to a lot of toxic things. And this diet is actually able to kind of cleanse yourself from all that because you're depleting all that right and there's no way to like target specific body parts like hey i want to lose fat in my midsection so i want to do this that's not how it works the way it works is that you're slowly going to lose fat over time it's going to all go together but matt said i'm not sure if the visceral fat gets targeted first first or not it's it's all genetic guys yeah. just like some people as you know is they gain weight it'll be in their waist sometimes it'll be more up sometimes it's an abdomen Unfortunately, we don't have the option to choose. It's, it's already been chosen for us. Right, yeah. I, I hear girls all the time where they're like, I've been losing weight, but my ass is shrunk and my waist is shrunk. I'm just like, yeah, that's because you had a bunch of fat in your ass, you know? Like, if you want to have a nice ass, you need some muscle in there, so go do some squats. Yeah, girls asking you about I mean, that, huh? Not asking me, but, you know, mm-hmm. back in the day, you know, when I had my abs, you know, I was I was pretty pretty high yeah. SNV over here. They're you asking know? you for tips. So it's like, yeah, you're going to lost your, your ass fat because you had fat in your ass, but you also lost... <laughs> fat from your abdomen, you know, so it's kind of like, it's, it's a win-win. Now you know you, your ass was fat, so now go to the gym and make it muscular. So yeah. Shit like that. That's that's very true. And I, that's, or get the booty band. You heard of the booty band? I have not. Okay. It's just a band that goes around your thighs, and a lot of girls use it for different exercises, and supposedly it strengthens the glutes and makes them more, you know, perky. Seems like you know a fairly good amount of this. I looked on Amazon, looked at reviews, just kind of buy it myself, you know. For yourself? <laughs> Okay, so what else about what about the research? So um, episode number twenty is going to be mass, Matt with an ass band. Yeah, and I'm going to let you guys know the review, my thirty day process, <laughs> before and after pictures, everything. <laughs> um, so th- that was a research study that compared um, very low carb diet and I'm sorry, a very low fat diet compared to the ketogenic diet, and it was a study compromised of fifteen hundred patients, both divided into different groups, low fat and then keto. And the person ate on average, what, no more than 50 grams of carbs. That was their rule of thumb. And we could look at some results of what these individuals or what this um, study revealed um, regarding the two diets. So for one, the keto group um, achieved greater weight loss in that um, specific amount of time. I don't know how, I think it was two months on this study. And then we looked at um, HDL levels, which um, actually increased in um, the keto diet. And that's a good thing because HDL is actually the, um, the good fat that we want, right? It's yes. a good level of, of cholesterol. I'm sorry, not fat. And also we have the keto diet increased their LDL levels. That's the bad one. Actually, in- interesting. Yeah, so they achieved how a we, greater one. Yeah, so how we, how much is before? So what... Research has shown is that eating a high fat diet, so the keto diet, the keto diet is a high fat diet, but it's also low carb and high protein. So the keto diet is high, is high fat, and the low fat diet is obviously low fat. So research showed that in the keto diet, which is high fat, it showed an increase in LDL, but it also showed a, in a higher increase in HDL compared to the low fat one. I see. So it did raise your LDLs, but also raise your HDLs more than it did with the low fat diet. Okay. So like I was saying before, it kind of counter counter. Actually, the, the effect of the LDL. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. And then um, there was no difference between like systolic blood pressure differences. They're also measuring to see whether following different types of diets would lead to like a decrease in um, your systolic blood pressure to get off the pills or whatever. That's more from weight loss when we covered um, that podcast episode mm-hmm. that I think losing two pounds or two kilos, which is four pounds, I think it drops you by like five milligrams of mercury. 
Um, and then fasting sugars weren't um, changed as much like that. So the study was really good and basically it pointed to keto being favored. Well, the fasting sugars were changed. They were changed. Yeah, so the fasting blood sugars were, were better in the um, the keto diet. Okay. And they're even better. So the one you mentioned, that's just our, the regular low, low-carb keto diet. Okay. But if you do like the very low, which I think is b- below 20 carbs, that even improves your fasting blood sugar ev- even more. Same with insulin levels. They were low, lower in the very low keto diet. And then your A1C was also lower and your C-reactive protein was also lower. So C-reactive protein is all, also attributed to a lot of inflammation. So all those diseases we mentioned before, like all those diseases that start in the gut, like per, uh, Parkinson's, things like that, or even even Alzheimer's that's attributed to inflammation, you're less prone to getting that as well. Okay. And another thing with this is seizure prevention, guys. So sometimes if you have a kid that's um, dealing with seizures and it's basically they can't figure out the source sometimes or they go on anti-convulsants, which is anti-seizure medication, sometimes what they recommend is actually going on a keto diet. And what happens is some somehow that when when the ketones are broken down by by fat, somehow these scientists discovered this molecule somehow had, the way it gets um, metabolized, it has some anti-convulsant properties. So it somehow protects your brain from being super reactive, right? Re- reaching that threshold and getting a seizure, which is awesome. Yeah, the keto diet is actually stemmed from from this. So people introduced the keto diet for people that, that were epileptics, and that was like in the 1940s or, or 50s. So when keto diet was, was created, it was not created for the public. There was no intention for them to, you know, release to the public or have any benefits on your on your average individual. But it showed that for people that have that were epileptic, it showed that it was in some cases it was better than medication. Wow. It actually worked had a quicker onset than medication. And a lot of times for people that are severe epileptics, they will use a keto and medication to kinda lower that or, or would it be heighten high the threshold so you won't reach it. Yeah. And so it was like a syzygenistic effect that ketogenic diet and anticonvulsants work together. But for a lot of people, these anticonvulsant medications, they have, you know, they make you feel side effects, side effects or so nauseous. You kind of, uh, you don't have as high, high of a mood. You know, it kind of, I don't want to say relaxes you, but kind of puts you in a, in a lower state. It, of it kind of numbs you to all mm. like sensory things. Exactly. Yeah. So I people were unsatisfied with this and they were fine with just having the keto diet. Yeah. Where a keto diet, diet did, did them just enough for them to prevent getting seizures yeah, without so the medication. A good example to think about this, guys, is like, let's just say you're like in a EDM concert and you have like the light show. Like there's so many lights flickering that your brain synapses are just firing so quick. You're reaching your threshold of what you can handle. And ev- eventually it's like a computer where you're just like, you need a reboot because your computer just just popped in a way. Mm-hmm. And... When and when you take these drugs, like just like you said, it numbs you a little bit. Where you're not, you can't take in that sensory experience and feel the same way about things. That's what even people say about antidepressants. So this helps the threshold basically. Right. And it's interesting because they're still not sure what exactly causes for you to have less seizures using ketone diet. And this diet's been out for almost like over fifty years. And they're still not what they're not sure. There's some kind of metabolite that's, that's released, or something happens with what ketones were. It like it I just said. somehow coats you and protects your brain. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And as you know, like the brain uses it prefers fat. I think as an energy source. That I'm not hundred percent sure, but I wanna. I'm not sure. But maybe it is carbs. Um, I will. I'll leave that one out, guys. I'm not gonna get quoted on that one. Well, actually, it, it might because if you think about it, if if it prefers glucose, then our brain probably wouldn't function as as well on, on ketones, right? So we. would We'd lose fat, but we also probably have a decline in cognition and mental function. We got to get a doctor right. on here I'm, I'm, about the ketones. My, but my pers- perspective is I, I think that it does not matter if okay. your brain uses that. Because think about it. If, if it preferred glucose and glucose was the number one thing for optimal optimal function, then we would have a decline in, in cognition. Yeah. Now, when I was on keto diet, I had probably the best thoughts of my life, you know? But, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's... All that, all that adv- ass advice, Peter. Mm-hmm. So foods to avoid uh, basically would be anything that's high carb, anything that's on those shelves that look very, very delicious with beautiful printed labels, that's your no-go. So anything soda-wise, fruit juices, your cakes, your ice creams, that's all gone. Anything pasta-wise, anything wheat, you want to avoid that as well. That's probably why maybe you decrease inflammation because of the biomarkers Mm. from maybe gluten. You never know, you're avoiding wheat. 
Um, fruits, so you want to limit fruits. You want to maybe eat some berries, which kind of have a higher fiber intake. So you want to just be careful. You don't want to eat a watermelon, <laughs> watermelon, because um, shout out to new album. Yeah, it's um, just very high in sugar. It's not really fibrous. Um, beans, um, just to a minimum. And then with the vegetables, we talked about how you could kind of manipulate things based on the fiber intake of that. Um, and then avoid unhealthy fats, guys. You guys don't want to be using up vegetable oils and things like that as a source of fat. Like, even though it's fat and even though you're going to be in ketosis, like, that's just not healthy. Trans fats, all that stuff, you want to avoid it. Alcohol, of course, yeah. which that's um, it's unfortunate huh, for keto people. Yeah, it's okay. You could, you could put the bottle down for a little bit. Or drink a White Claw. <laughs> white Claw. Yeah, there's a shortage, isn't there? A national shortage of White Claws. Yeah. Oh, did you did you see all those nurse memes? Yeah. That was kind of funny. It was ridiculous, man. Guys, in the future, I think we're going to do a little um, YouTube series just for reviewing um, nurse memes, and that's going to be outside of the podcast, so make sure you guys subscribe to us on YouTube for that. Yeah. So a few tips. So like what to consume. You could probably stock up on all the cheese and meat, meat you would like. So the question is, is how to follow a ketogenic diet and what to do, right? Yeah. So we already said eliminate carbs and matter. We touched upon things you shouldn't, shouldn't eat, but... What should you eat? I mean, meat and cheese, you know, you could, you could free ball those, eggs, things like that, avocados. You, know, you want to use like olive oil or coconut oil or something on, on a healthier side. Coconut oil isn't even that really, really healthy anymore. It's, it's been proven. But, but like, I, like Matt said, low carbs. If you're lactose intolerant, I'm not sure what you can do for cheese. I put cheese on everything. I like, I like cheese a lot. But there's like lactose intolerant cheese and milks and dairy items that, that you could buy. Um, I've, I've cut G, uh, cheese away from my life down to a minimum and i feel better honestly and i think i'm just i can't tolerate fats well right like yeah so what a, basically you can eat a lot of meat a lot of meat a lot of cheese a lot of dairy um, a lot of vegetables which is which is another positive aspect of this diet is you're going to force yourself to eat, eat vegetables if you don't eat enough you're going to need to eat them just for for the fiber and just because you want to feel full you also the thing is also that i saw a lot is a lot of times when you eat high carb foods or these these pre-made meals or things like that they're usually four to five where lots of minerals and lots of vitamins so it's always good to take a multivitamin and it's also good to add a little seasoning or some salt on your food because you're not gonna have much fortified fried food like cereals are fortified with a bunch of vitamins a lot of times bread's four to five and you're gonna limit all that so you're gonna you might lose a little bit on, on the vitamins and minerals that's the nutrition side and right on that nutrition nutrition side so you could easily take a multivitamin or you know try to f- figure something out that, that you're getting all your magnesium and your, and your sodium because you're eating sodium. Just be very aware. If you start seeing little, you know, dots on your nails or your nails feel more brittle, your hair keeps falling out more, yeah. troubleshoot that. You know, add some vitamins, add a mineral, go to get some freaking sunshine, get some adequate sleep. Like all those little things affect your well-being. And then especially switching up a diet, your, your body's already in a state of shock. Like you don't need that, you know, out of balance sync when you know you're only sleeping five hours when you're transitioning to keto right another, another tip is also you want to make sure you eat fiber you know it doesn't matter if you get a fiber supplement or or getting a fiber from foods because the one issue that i had is i tried to completely eliminate carbs and that ended up completely eliminating my fiber and i was having upset stomachs and i was trying to figure out why you know why can i have a nice formed poop you know it's all like loose and stuff and then i realized i'm not eating any fiber because i completely cut out all my car- carbs And that's actually a downside of having a fiber diet is, I'm sorry, a keto diet is you eliminating fiber. And fiber is very important as like, you know, adds bulk to the digestive tract, it slows it down, you're able to, you know, absorb more nutrients, you're able to have a better bowel pattern. And because you're eating less fiber, you're also, you had a different issue where it's too loose. Sometimes you are at risk of constipation. Yeah, I I was on and off. I was, it was either too loose, but I never felt like either... It felt too loose, or I felt like I haven't been been shedding in, in days, okay. and I was trying to figure out why. And I realized, hey, dude, I'm not eating any kind of carbs. And then I added some more carbs. I was minding myself to like less than twenty, but a lot of times I end up having like almost no carbs. So I bumped it up to fifty or less, but I try to get those carbs all in fiber. So like you said, you could either either count the carbs from fiber, or or you cannot. I count mine from fiber because I need some kind of fiber. So I made sure that if I ate 50 carbs, or it's probably like 40 carbs from fiber. You should have started taking a colase from work instead. <laughs> no, I'm taking it in a, at night for freaking a regular, um, add some more bulk in there. Oh, man, it's too much, man, too much. Um, at the end of the day, guys, it comes down to just being consistent, to be honest. Like, there's no shortcuts for success. If you want this, 
Like you got to meal prep a little bit. You got to prepare your meals because you are switching things up. Like you can't be going for that bowl of cereal that you always wanted or that you always grab. So now you're going to like feel so out of sync and like you had a routine. Now you don't have a routine and that makes life so much harder because now you're using your mental energy into creating food and thinking of food instead of you just grabbing a bowl of cereal while you're swiping and getting ready for work. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like you're almost rewire, rewires your brain because you don't eat the same foods that you've been used to eating and you kind of explore more, kind of build some neuroplasticity in your in your brain for the most part because that was a time where I discovered like, low-carb noodles. So because I was craving pasta so much because I haven't had pasta in like two months and I really like pasta, you know, like like chicken, like, you know, chicken and pasta or like, like shrimp scampi or like, like shrimp with pasta that I wanted to figure out a way, how the hell can I have pasta without, you know, the carbs? So that's how I found out about, about noodles about carbless noodles which was fucking amazing damn and guys another um risk where we kind of talked about is is your gut at risk with um eating keto and that's one of those downside downsides that are being tested and it's not sure and there was a study that involved um 217 people from ages 18 to 35 they were healthy they're following keto and then they had like a low they all had keto one was the low moderate and then the high fat so they had three different um variations and they follow them throughout six months and what happened is they had an unfavorable change in the gut bacteria so researchers are saying that you might be having increased pro-inflammatory factors at a long-term level if you're following keto so there's not enough research to pinpoint this but this is one of those drawbacks where hey the lack of fiber and you completely switching away from carbs is altering your you know your gut bacteria yeah i wish we could have studied a little bit deeper because i'm not i don't think it took into consideration how much carbs they were eating and how much of those carbs are actually from fiber i'm sure it's a limited study yeah. because like i said before like i had the same issues with with my, with my gut but that was because i wasn't make i wasn't consuming any fiber just like the way the keto jag diet raises your ldls it also increases your, your hdls so maybe consuming some fiber or high fiber carbs or carbs mainly derived from fiber that might counter affects this inflammation because one of the benefits that we talked about was the anti-inflammatory effects of not eating carbs and anti-inflammatory effects of the ketogenic diet and now this study is saying that too much fat now creates inflammation in your, in your yeah. gut but i'm thinking that maybe this could be you know um debunked or maybe these negatives can be negated just by consuming some fiber maybe maybe not We'll see, guys. I think that summarizes it. What do you think? Yeah. We cool. got, we got, we cool. We gave you guys an awesome rundown of keto. We have tried it, see some good results. I personally only stuck to it about a month, to be honest. It wasn't my thing. Um, I like fasting instead. So give it us, give it a try. Let us know what you think of the keto and give us a thumbs up around the YouTube community. Give us a star in the podcast community. And we're, Looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Yep. Have a good one, guys.